What they care about is the business outcomes that are achieved. And the way we help our customers to achieve those outcomes is giving them both rational and emotional confidence in the decisions we're hoping we're going to make. The Industrial Growth Institute podcast connects you with the big thinkers, makers, and subject matter experts across all aspects of an integrated B2B industrial revenue growth function. From strategy, board oversight and transactions, through all the phases of manufacturing marketing, the complexities of industrial sales, and the nuances of marketing and sales technology and customer experience, I speak with guests who bring insights, innovative perspectives, best practices, and twists on traditional approaches. Each episode explores high-level thinking and in-the-weeds actionable tactics. If you enjoyed these discussions, then please help me out by liking and sharing the podcast, and especially by leaving a comment and giving a review. So with no further ado, let's jump into this episode. Hello, I'm Ed Marsh, host of the Industrial Growth Institute podcast. When we talk about industrial revenue growth, there's a huge range of topics to cover. And I'm so lucky that for each episode, I get to chat with somebody that's really got a unique perspective on on that, or in some cases, several aspects of it. Today, I'm excited to talk with Bob Apollo. Bob is the founder and chief outcomes officer. Remember that title. It's going to be important as we talk of uh, his company called Inflection Point Strategy Partners. It's a sales effectiveness consultancy that specializes in helping clients adopt to outcome centric sales as an approach for complex B2B buying environments. He's sold for years, as you're going to hear as we talk about his career through various market situations and evolutions of sales best practice. And he really is kind of one of those quintessential folks who you can really say he's probably forgotten more about sales than most of us are ever going to know. I know him as a guy who's really uniquely cerebral about complex sales. A lot of people that spout off a lot of stuff, but he thinks very deeply about it. And of course, as soon as we uh, talk to him and you hear from him, you're going to recognize that his accent adds an immediate uh, degree of credibility to all his recommendations. So joining me today from Spain, I think via Poland and originally the UK, I'm excited to welcome Bob. Thanks for joining us. Ed, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm looking forward to this and to trying to do any sort of justice to that introduction. <laughs> well, you're going to you're not only going to do it justice, you're going to blow it away. I know from having read your stuff for years, but let's start with what's really important. I think you're sitting today on the westernmost edge of the Mediterranean Sea. So tell us when you look out your window what you see and and what the weather's like and how you ended up there. Well, you know, only if my career had been even more successful, I'd be in a frontline villa. But we're about <laughs> uh, 300 meters from the beach. Wow. If I look out the back window, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, unspoiled uh, countryside. And if we simply stride those 300 uh, meters, uh, it'd be a beautiful bay um, and a little further along a beautiful sandy beach. So it's not a bad location. Well, it sounds beautiful. And and am I correct that you, obviously you started in the UK, but then I think you, you through the years, you spent time in Poland, right? Well, uh, I, I, actually, I visited Poland both um, for holiday and, and for business. The Polish connections actually through my father, who was one of many um, Polish servicemen who found themselves in the UK uh, in the Second World War and decided to stay. Got it. But of course, because of that, um, I am able to inherit his Polish citizenship. I see. So despite the fact the UK very foolishly decided to leave the European Union, I am, remain a European citizen through that connection. Understand. And And then what caused you and at what point did you decide to trade in the kind of dreary winters of the UK for the sun and sparkling Mediterranean of Spain? Well, I, I think you've said it. Um, I, I, and by the way, <laughs> I consider myself um, a, a European. I haven't completely cut uh, ties with the UK. We maintain a place in, in Poole on the south coast of the UK, which is uh, in a broadly similar situation. When I walk the dog in the morning, it's 300 meters to the beach. Wow. Um, a different beach, but, you know, similar scenario. So um, I was sort of born, raised um, in the UK, but I'm, I'm very pleased to think of myself as a European citizen and not just a Brit. And with all that time by the sea, are you a sailor? Uh, no, uh, I'm not even sure I like very much getting my feet wet unless the water's warm. <laughs> um, beautiful photos, I guess. Yeah. 
Cool. Um, so let's start with the beginning of your career. A few years ago, um, you kind of started with one of the great enterprises of the 20th century. You started selling with Hewlett Packard, I think, in 1981. You've worked in many organizations and different sales and management roles, mostly in tech and software, I guess, mm -hmm. through about 2006 when you launched your consultancy. So listeners today really have a unique opportunity to not only hear about best practice today, but really importantly about the context of your journey and the evolution of sales over the modern B2B sales area and, and your thinking on it. So kind of kick us off, take us on a tour of that professional journey, and then we'll dive into more details. Well, you know, and it started even earlier than that. I was reminded of it. I was writing a little uh, article of the, you know, stages I've grown through. Uh, and in fact, my selling career started, I was uh, selling a subscription book club door to door wow. in the northwest suburbs of London. And, uh, and then after I graduated, uh, did a business studies degree, um, got posted to a graduate recruitment scheme of the UK's largest energy company and hated it. <laughs> so I, I, I went to the opposite extreme. I I actually sold motor accessories door to door out of the back of a battered old Ford van. Mm. Um, so you, you get dirt under your fingernails when you start um, selling like that. Yeah, I think and you, you, I you have that in common with our mutual friend, Dave Curlin, who I think was selling Cutco knives, if I remember correctly, beginning his sales career. Right. It, it's not a bad grounding. Right. Um, but I, I think the decision, and it was a very conscious decision, I, I targeted HP rather than responded to an ad or a headhunter because I realized I'd reached a stage in my sales career where I needed to work for an organization that was going to give me real professional development. And in those days, Hewlett Packard was an absolute exemplar of the sort of Silicon Valley tech culture. And it's a decision I've never regretted. And I think it's probably true that uh, that, uh, that period with HP, the, the 80s, um, taught me things, uh, not just skills or, or experiences, but also values that I've, um, I've kept for, through the rest of my career. And I mean, it was a pretty interesting company in, in those days. Sure. But, um, you know, very few um, companies, no matter how well endowed they are, um, really have any sort of in-depth training for new salespeople. And HP, like many other of the leading vendors in those days, had a sort of multi-month program. So like IBM and Xerox um, and some of those yeah. giants that you hear about. Yeah, of uh, induction. Right. And, and very valuable it was too. Um, you know, flew out to the West Coast. Uh, flew out to Boise, Idaho, where I was inducted into the uh, apparently traditional local American sport of cow tipping, <laughs> uh, as well as learning how disc drives are made. Right. Um, but, you know, a HP absolutely had a set of values and, 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 a, and an approach to selling that has uh, been absolutely foundational in um, everything else I've done and learned since. And, and I think that's reflected, and we'll see it reflected through our conversation in the very methodical and um, carefully built framework that you've created, where many people kind of talk about this ad hoc agglomeration of various sales activities, and let's do enough of each one, and hopefully some of it works. You say, no, let's step back and look at how we really need to proceed sensibly, consistently, predictably through a process. So I'm sure that you bring that with you from the very beginning of your career. Uh, I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, people sometimes throw the question out, you know, is uh, sales art or science? And the proper answer to that is it's a blend of both. Sure. But I think the thing that HP added to that equation is a third dimension, and that is sales as engineering. So if you think of engineering as being the discipline of creating replicable processes and progressive improvement and so on. Right. So, you know, I think HP absolutely taught me that B2B selling is art and it's science and it's engineering. Right. Yeah, I love blended that. Blended together. Process engineering, continuous improvement. Those are fundamental mm -hmm. building blocks of how most companies run their business and then completely absent in the way they run their marketing and sales in many cases. You, you mentioned writing this uh, autobiographical um, recap of your career. 
is there a single kind of biggest change in B2B sales that you identified for each of the decades that you've navigated? Uh, I mean, it would be very convenient, wouldn't it, if there was a very clean break, uh, one decade to the other decade and so on. Um, I, I think there's been an evolutionary path, which certain people and certain organizations have followed either more quickly or more slowly. And that is the sort of evolution from a, a product or feature-centric approach to selling to a sort of phase which I regard as an intermediate phase around you know what people label as solution or consultative selling. Mm -hmm. Of course, the challenge with both of those mindsets is, by and large, um, they assume the sale is over when the order's taken. And I think we're now in an age, you know, where increasingly things are being consumed as services, uh, even if they're sold outright. The way in which the customer subsequently consumes what's been bought is incredibly important for usage retention and so on. And that's why I think we're now in a third phase where the focus really is and needs to be on the business outcomes mm -hmm. and not simply on either our products or our so-called solution. So if you think of this as not a sales process, but a buying journey, that buying journey is never really over until the customer acknowledges that they've derived the business value that they were looking for and they've got the outcomes that they saw when they first set off on their sort of path of discovery. Yeah, I, so that's really interesting. Most people think of the outcomes as what should happen if you make the decision you buy it. You're saying you have to follow through and actually make sure those outcomes are achieved, which seems particularly important in a world where there's so much skepticism and hesitance and you know buyer indecision and all the things. We'll talk later, I think, about the jolt effect a little bit. But yeah, that's exactly the kind of stuff that Matt Dixon and Ted McKenna were talking about in that book that I've seen you reference, I think. Uh, I think that was a sort of fantastic book. I enjoyed it very much. Of course, Matt Dixon's got history. He was part of the team that wrote the Challenger sale, what, maybe a decade ago right, now. Right. Um, but um, the, the jolt effect drew our attention to something. If you think about it, it's probably been hiding in plain sight all of this time that um, a lot of B2B selling was sort of predicated around uh, the fear of missing out. In other words, trying to persuade the customer that if they didn't take action, bad things will happen. Right. And, and what the jolt effect you know, drew our attention back to was at some point in the decision-making cycle, the focus shifts not from a fear of missing out, but to the fear of messing up if they do make a decision. From FOMO to FOMO. Or, 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 or as somebody else relabeled it, FOFU, <laughs> but I doubt that that would have made it into the publication. And fascinating background research. You think about Kahneman's thinking fast and slow and all the behavioral mm -hmm. economics that goes into it on the one hand. And on the other hand, the very real reality that I hear so many business owners talk about that we win 30% of our deals we lose 30% of our deals and 40% of our deals just evaporate into the ether. Nothing ever happens. This, this, this uh, idea yeah. of loss to no decision, which the jolt effect, I think, really um, kind of recasts as indecision. Um, but definitely, I, I can see where the outcomes fit into that. And I'm really looking forward to that part of the conversation. Um, so we've talked about some of the history, some of what shaped your thinking, giving us context to understand going forward. Obviously, the here and now and the next three years is what's most important, and we'll we'll kind of lean into that. And I want to start with accountability. I mm -hmm. think accountability is one of the biggest changes I've seen in sales and business over the course of the last five or ten years. And it's it's on both sides. With sales reps, they're more resistant to oversight and accountability for activity and following process and using CRM and all those kinds of steps are important. At the same time, on the buyer side, decision makers are kind of more hesitant to make unilateral decisions. They they want to make sure that the buying team is on board and makes a committee decision so they're not held accountable for something. Does that echo or, or, or match what you're seeing? Well, I, I think you've raised a very interesting subject, and I think you're right. It applies both uh, in the selling and in the buying side of the equation. Um, 
In fact, when I sort of assess sales organizations, I tend not to think just about their skills, but about their attitudes and their behaviors and the, and the culture of the organization. And I, I think there is an issue in, in some, maybe many sales organizations, where uh, that sense of accountability isn't anything like as strongly held uh, as it should be. And, and you see, um, if you like, the opposite of accountability <laughs> in excuse making. Right. That, um, you know, failure is never the responsibility of the individual. It's because the company's pricing structure was wrong or some other or market circumstances. Or so it takes too long to get quotes happened. or the competitors cheat or the buyers don't know what they're talking about or all kinds of stuff. They're endless. But, uh, I, I, but I don't think it's fair just to home in on the salesperson because I think organizations either have a, a culture of accountability or they don't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this needs to flow through, certainly from the line managers in their day-to-day -day, uh, motivation and management of people, but also in the more senior uh, managers. Sure. Um, uh, I don't think it's a lost star. I think it exists. I think it exists in the healthiest organizations. But I think a weakness of accountability is one of the reasons why uh, many salespeople and many sales organizations have been struggling. Mm -hmm. Now, if you flip it over and you think of it from a buyer's perspective, um, I think there is an increased sensitivity uh, to avoid being blamed for a bad decision. If you think about the effect that that can have on your career, um, you know, loss of promotion or, or worse, right. um, if your name is associated with what subsequently is recognized or believed to have been a bad decision. And so, yes, there's a need for sort of consensus making. Um, and that's one of the things that slows buying decisions down. Um, you know, I think that there was an age, and I think it was actually a pretty long time ago, as far as technology products were concerned, where, you know, bad decisions were made and software ended up on the shelf, for example, right. um, with probably precious little real accountability for it. But if we're in a, as a service age, You've got the CFO on your back, probably. Uh, if you approach him saying, I want this renewed, he or she is going to say, well, show me the money. Right. Show me the benefits that are being derived. And if you can't, I'm not going to sanction the, the renewal. Now, that can be reputationally bad um, as well. So I think accountability is on both sides of the equation of the seller and, and, and the buyer. I think the very interesting thing about the jolt effect, to come back to the book that you quoted a few minutes ago, is to look at practical techniques to make the uh, buyer, the stakeholders, typically not an individual buyer, the stakeholders, comfortable with the decision to support change, mm -hmm. de-risking it, um, helping them to feel confident in the decision that they're making, uh, having their uh, preference validated by others who've gone down the same path successfully, uh, and so on. But of course, it, your premise that you haven't, you haven't truly won the sale just when you get the signed contract and down payment, but only once the buyer has achieved the outcomes they have in mind, really dovetails with that. It recognizes that if, if, if your goal is set that far out, then you're much more likely to be doing the proactive things that are necessary to make the prospect comfortable with the fact that you'll see it all the way through for them. For sure. Uh, and so, uh, you know, having an outcome-centric focus certainly helps post-sell. It's the sort of thing that customer success people need to be very focused on, not just the day-to-day -day operational implementation of the system, mm but testing that the business benefits are visible inside, uh, inside the customer. But I also think you improve your chances of winning the customer's business if a big part of your conversation is about not functional needs and how you satisfy them, but the results that the potential customer is trying to accomplish. Organizationally and, and individually. At both levels, organizational outcomes, individual outcomes. Organizational outcomes tend to be expressed 
in more rational terms. <laughs> but uh, individual outcomes, particularly if you're an important stakeholder in the decision, uh, have a very strong emotional dimension right. as well right. to them. So on the topic of accountability, I think that kind of ties in with how honest we are in our self-appraisal and in our appraisal of our colleagues. And I, I, I saw an interesting interview that Shane Parrish from the Knowledge Project did with, I think his name is Frank Slootman, who's the CEO of Snowflake, who really drew a very simple, but I thought brilliant um, distinction between performance. In other words, it may take you some time to get better, to practice enough, to do enough iterations, to be through enough coaching, enough role playing, whatever, to to improve and contrasting that with behavior, which is the decisions that you make today. Are you going to pick up the phone? Are you going to send the email? Are you going to go to the networking event? Are you going to do those things that we know are important? And and his point is we can be very patient with performance. We're extraordinarily impatient with behavior. Um, have you seen companies that kind of model that in a way that that reinforces accountability? Uh, yeah, it's a, such an interesting question, and I, I, I probably struggle to find a, a benchmark um, case of that. But I, but I sense what you've just described is one of the things that differentiates organizations mm -hmm. that uh, you know have the foundations of long term success from those who are constantly reorienting or 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 what have you. Right. And this whole sort of self honesty thing, which I think is part as well of coaching attitude and and behavior um if salespeople are not honest with themselves they do neither themselves or anybody else any favors you know if they um sweep under the carpet things that they kind of feel but they've never bothered to verify or test or they they base their um you know their decisions or their justification on assumptions rather or happy than happy years uh, so self honesty is absolutely critical and again i think it's something that is either reinforced or 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 or, or compromised by by the culture For sure yeah i think definitely um so so i want to talk process and i want to talk methodology and then i want to talk more about outcome centric and whether it's a process or a methodology or a combination exactly how it fits in but first, starting with methodology, I think the first one that I really remember in my sales career was Sandler. And mm -hmm. shortly after that, I discovered SPIN. And SPIN for me, particularly the I, the implication questions in the middle there, really changed the way that I thought about sales. And I, I think it still is tremendously relevant, at least the implications piece, because that echoes so many of the best practices of understanding compelling reasons to buy and everything else. Um, what was really the most formative methodology along the way for you? Uh, you know, honestly, I think it was probably spin. I was less exposed to Sandler in the early days, uh, but I was exposed to spin in a number of um, companies. I completely agree uh, with your conclusion, and of course Rackham's conclusion, that the implication aspects of questioning are absolutely vital and a very, very key differentiator between uh, highly effective salespeople uh, and ineffective salespeople. You know, what, one of the things I observe is that um, the less effective salespeople um, in, it tend to jump far too quickly from an identified need or problem to pitching their right, solution. Right. Yeah, you know, they can't resist the itch. <laughs> Whereas the more effective salespeople have the discipline to stick with the problem and don't just go, thank you for telling me about that need or problem. Here's how we fix right. it. But they explore the dimensions and the implications of the issue. And they can make a far better judgment about, you know, is this just a cosmetic problem or is it something that this particular customer is going to have to address because of the impact and the implications. Um, that was an absolutely um, seminal work for me. Um, I had the chance to meet Rackham on a couple of occasions. He's uh, uh, a very engagingly, uh, slightly eccentric, but brilliant man and, and thinks 
I think, very deeply um, about selling. And of course, it was based on a great deal of research as well, um, you know, which was a you know, foundation. Um, you know, there was one thing about spin, though, that if you read, um, firstly, I think the, the definitions that were embedded in the first edition of the spin book, um, the, the four question categories remain valid, but, uh, but I think the interpretation of them has changed. So, so I, example, I completely missed that. I'm, th this sounds fascinating. Tell me more about that. So, um, you know, let, let's think about problems. So I think if you were to read literally... And if I can interrupt, just for, to set the context for folks that aren't familiar with SPIN, this four-letter yeah. four acronym stands for situation questions, problem questions, implication questions, yeah. and what he calls need payoff. So sorry for interrupting, yeah. but you were going to talk about no, problems. No, no, thanks for framing that. So, um, you know, let, let's say a situation. It, it, a very probably contemporary interpretation when the book was released was, what is their current situation? And then if you think about problems, it was mostly about what are the current problems? Uh, implications, what are the implications of those current problems? Now, I, I, I think we can adapt that thinking and say that our discussion of problems isn't necessarily and shouldn't be restricted just to problems or issues the customer already recognizes. But, you know, challenger-like, injecting the thought that maybe there are things they haven't considered, okay. that once they do confront them, uh, the customer would say, yes, that is actually an issue. I haven't thought about it before. And for people who aren't Same. familiar with the challenger sale, I think what you're describing is an approach that sounds like experience tells me companies like yours are typically wrestling with these three key problems. Yeah. Rather than saying, hey, you know, uh, what keeps you up at night or some some kind of moronic question like that, but rather use your expertise that you've developed, your understanding yeah. of the market to prompt people with information they may have thought of or may not have quite codified in their own thinking. But, but, but I think particularly to open their uh, thinking up to something they hadn't previously considered. I think it, it's that act of from the recognized to the unrecognized problem, from the recognized to the unrecognized implication that's so powerful. A anyway, um, spin selling um, based on tens of thousands, I think, of interviews and hours of research identify those four question types. But it also um, pointed out that one of the distinctive differences between a really effective salesperson and the less effective ones is um, the, the less effective salespeople tend to either be disqualified by the customer. In other words, the customer says, look, this is just not worth continuing the conversation, or they'll get a weak uh, continuation. In, in other words, the customer doesn't throw them out, agrees to continue talking with them, but nothing meaningful really else happens. You know, I'll have another conversation with you. Whereas the more effective salespeople are, uh, are much more willing to either disqualify fairly early on in the cycle based on rational evaluation of the facts, or, uh, and, and this is something that Rackham pointed out as the, as the fourth outcome of a sales conversation, it's that the customer is persuaded to agree to an advance. And that advance is some sort of tangible action on their part that requires some effort, time, uh, political capital, what have you. But it's more than just agreeing to keep talking. Or, or this sounds good, send me a quote. Yeah. And you think, wow, you know, I've made progress. <laughs> move it, move it really, up the sales you, pipeline to 80% likelihood now. Done deal. The, the, the customer's just trying to shut you up right. and defeat you. Out of them. So, so we've got those first four questions. And I think there's a fifth one, which um, Rackham implied when he wrote about advances. And those are what I refer to as commitment questions. And those are questions that enable us to test the customer's willingness to take that substantive step forward to agree to an adva a real advance. And, and so I look at SPIN now as actually having five question types and not four, with commitment questions being that really important 
And, and commitment questions are a vital lubricant of advancing the sale from stage to stage to stage and testing whether we really have any genuine momentum right. or whether we're just, you know, pretty much floating around where we are. And I think commitment is an important part of your impact framework that we're going to talk about yeah. shortly. But before yeah. we drift too far away, I want to come back to outcome centric selling and and help me understand, is it a methodology? Is it a process? What is it? <laughs> oh. I suppose it's an attitude which um, is uh, expressed in some part in methodology and in some part in in process. I'm a little wary, by the way, I always have been, of using the word process too rigorously in a sales environment. So if you think of the, math, uh, the um, manufacturing parallel, a manufacturing process has some extremely clearly defined steps. Mm -hmm. You might move from one stage to the next. You might move from one machine to the next. Uh, every unit of output uh, needs to uh, comply with exactly the same parameters, those that don't get rejected or reworked and so on. And so you're almost striving for perfection, uh, you know, Six Sigma um, and so on. I don't think complex B2B buying decisions can be thought of in quite that way. They're, they're inherently variable. It's impossible, I think, to therefore imagine that you could run an absolutely perfect sales process every time just because the dynamics are different. So I'm, I'm actually more interested in, if you like, the lean movement, which is about eliminating waste mm -hmm. or eliminating avoidable errors. And so in part, when I have a discussion uh, about sales process, let's use the label process. It's as much about, certainly it's about steps and stages. We may come on to the parallels or lack of parallels between a defined sales process and how buyers actually typically come to a decision. We're going to get to that for sure. Um, um, but um, actually, maybe what we should be doing instead of striving for perfection is eliminating uh, predictable and avoidable sources of error. Mm -hmm. You know, where you, 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 the salesperson might say, I wish I'd known that before. I wish I'd done that before. I wish I hadn't done that before. So, so for me, um, effective selling is as much about, or maybe more about, helping salespeople to anticipate and eliminate avoidable mistakes and errors, errors of judgment, of omission, of commission, and so on um, in the process. Yeah, I think I, I think it's closer to manufacturing process than you may be um, kind of comfortable with. But I, I think of manufacturing process, for instance, as understanding how factors that are less concrete may be lighting. And airflow and temperature and humidity mm -hmm. and um, the the material handling considerations between workstations, those kinds of things, but also very specifically developing the right kinds of fixtures or tools in mm -hmm. order to make sure that there is a great deal of repeatability or the inverse that we're eliminating um, variability, just like you're describing. So I, I, I think there's a lot of similarity between them. I, I, I'm not suggesting there aren't. I, 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 I'm probably thinking as much about maybe the naive um, understanding of manufacturing process from somebody who's never been involved sure, in it, sure. you know, that it is just step and step and step and as simple as that. But I don't want to get sucked into details before we really give you a chance. I mean, this outcome centric selling is your opus and, and, and there's a, uh, a lot of years and thought and experience and bruises and scars and victories that have gone into creating it. Um, so, so tell me more about how you visualized it, how, how it evolved. Well, I, I suppose it was, it's evolved and it continues to evolve as a combination of observation and reflection and trying to understand what works and what doesn't and and how the environment has changed. Mm -hmm. So I certainly think that the the recognition of the growing 
um, consumption of things as a service rather than as an outright purchase right. has been one of the the key catalysts. And uh, I think we've we've seen even in industries and in offerings that were traditionally sold only on an outright purchase basis, that you know there's been a movement towards. Uh, a service-oriented relationship with the customer. I mean, my goodness, uh, for years, I think Rolls-Royce had been selling aero engines, not as aero engines, but as, you know, hours of, right. uh, you know, uh, the engine delivered and in, in, in use and right. so on. Uh, and I think when you start to think about that, you, 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 it becomes very obvious that thinking that the selling process is over when the order's taken is a very much is a very mistaken um, mindset. So, so I think the move to um, increasing delivery of things as a consumption as a service is part of it. But I also think it's um, a, a natural evolution of you know the shift initially from a product or functional approach to a quote solution approach, and progressively becoming more intimately concerned with um, what the customer is trying to accomplish and not just what you're trying to sell to them. I mean, in a way, it's, uh, you know, it's got its uh, relationship to that question, you know, the customer's buying a quarter-inch drill or a quarter-inch um, hole. Right. So, you know, it is a, I, I think it's a natural reflection of how the more thoughtful people who look at B2B selling are, are seeing, you know, the world uh, evolving. Yeah, to, to use a similar analogy, a lot of people talk about the shovel or the hole. I would say mm -hmm. that what you're doing with outcome-based selling is, is moving past the hole. You're moving to the shrub that's planted and mulched and blooming the next spring. I mean, that's the outcome that people really want. Uh, yes, uh, and that that tree thrives through uh, the four seasons, right. um, you know, grows uh, and becomes, a, you know, a really appreciated part of the landscape. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah, it, it, Sorry. Uh, by the way, I just wanted to congratulate you. I think this is the first time mulched has ever been used in an interview. But, uh, <laughs> well, one of my hobbies, I love getting out of the yard, building things. And, and uh, so I guess, you know, I'm, I'm revealing some of my natural bias. Um, I, I often have conversations with executives who are horrified when I kind of drop the unkind bomb on them that nobody cares about the product or service. That mm -hmm. nobody gets out of bed in the morning excited to piss away their time during the day investigating and comparing and 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 making these value judgments about will they actually follow through on what they say and what's the right one and should we change anything and what's the change management going to be like and what are the hidden costs and all those kinds of things nobody wants to do that what they want is the business outcome and so mm -hmm. i mean right out of the gate i love the idea of your outcome centric selling simply because it starts to set that mindset that seems to be such a huge hurdle for many companies in my space, the industrial manufacturing space, to overcome. Uh, yeah. Yes, and I, I, and I think we do have, we have a, a certain amount of evangelism to do right. to help leaders to embrace and understand that and that, you know, what your customer cares about is what matters to them and not what matters to you. Right. And, you know, you're a, a potential uh, catalyst, uh, what have you, for helping them to achieve what's important to them. And you talked about no decision. I mean, all too often, it occurs to me, so, you know, when I talk to salespeople who have a rather narrow perspective on these things, if the customer expresses interest, you know, they, it's almost assumed they're going to buy. The question is, from who? All right. Now, um, I, I don't think that reflects reality at all in the B2B space. Uh, I, I've started over the last couple of years to share a very simple matrix with. Um, the 
salespeople and sales organizations I coach, which basically says, think about two things. Is uh, the customer's purchase an inevitable one or a discretionary one? And all too often, salespeople assume, well, I'm competing against other vendors because the customer's going to buy, and I want to persuade them to buy from me. The, and I think that happens particularly, let's say, let's think about it for, uh, I don't know, transactional sales. Let's say I'm, I'm running a, a power station and I need to energy. So it's inevitable that I need to find a supply of energy. I might switch suppliers, but if I want to keep the power station running, I need a source of, uh, you know, a source of energy, mm -hmm. generation of uh, electricity. Um, but very often, more often than I think salespeople acknowledge, the customer uh, potential purchase is discretionary. They could choose to do nothing. Just stick with the status quo. Or they could choose a completely different solution. They could outsource uh, it rather well, than right. trying to decide to do it internally or whatever the case may be. So, it, it, and very often that happens, particularly when, um, you know, the ways of addressing issues are being transformed by new approaches. Right. Uh, you know, they might do something in-house. They might uh, outsource it. They might take a completely different perspective. Now, those are all really uh, competition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they imply that, the purchase is a discretionary one. Certainly if you think of the purchase being our class of offering. Right. But it gets worse than that. <laughs> because <laughs> actually, um, and the reason for many no decisions is maybe as a salesperson, you defeated the obvious competition. If they go ahead, you're selected. But actually, and this is particularly true, I think, in the more complex and discretionary purchases, your competition can also be another completely different project, right. which is competing for the funding, the restricted amount of funding and other resources that are available. And a, so a classic example win. of that these days is a cybersecurity problem. So regardless yeah. of whether it means they have to walk away from a customer where if they could add the capacity, they could add a customer, grow revenue, that may not even matter if they have to address something like a cybersecurity sort of an issue. That's where the money's going, period. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, we may come to talk about qualification. By the way, this is one reason why I've never been a great fan of BANT, and I'm even less of a fan of budget, authority, need, time frame. So let me first acknowledge, I think it's pretty much inevitable that any successful opportunity, at some point, it has to be, has to have a budget, you have to be talking to somebody in authority. There has to be a clear need, and there needs to be some time frame or urgency. Sure. But, but it's so risky to think. So Gartner found that um, about half of successful projects were not formally budgeted to start with. The budget was found because you got to a point in the buying journey where somebody with sufficient power and authority said, we need to find the money for this. And they do. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways they find the money is by stealing the budget from another or you know, previously formally uh, budgeted project. That's somewhere so in a sales cool. pipeline, was... qualifying with Bant at 80% likelihood to close with the, the salesperson having no clue that the whole thing is crumbling because that money is going somewhere else. It, it gets moved. It gets stolen. If you if If the sponsor of the... You know, the, the emerging project has sufficient political skill internally within the company right. to know how to move the money around, they will. Right. And by the way, if we're not talking or engaged with somebody that has that level of skill and authority, I think that's a real risk factor. So that was one dimension, um, for, uh, you know, inevitable or discretionary. And the other way of thinking of it is, uh, and are, are they embarked on a buying process, a journey? that is familiar to them. In other words, they've successfully navigated the purchase of something similar before, which gives them confidence that they know what they're doing. Or are they entering new territory? Are they trying to consider something which they've never successfully bought before um, and which carries 
a whole load of risk in terms of the decision process. But which in many but, cases, but, alarmingly, they may still have abundant confidence that they know how to do it, even though it's completely new to them. So, uh, and I, by the way, I think that's an important role for a salesperson to lead the customer right. towards an acknowledgement that the the process and, and you know if you're selling to a large organization they will have a buying process typically at least they'll have a procurement right. or contract negotiation process so they kind of understand the mechanics but they don't understand what's really important in making the right decision so i think yeah one of the things a salesperson absolutely needs to be do in a very um helpful way is, is to help cus potential customers realize that actually the lessons they're trying to apply from some of their previous uh, buying uh, processes are not necessarily completely applicable here. And there's some other dimensions that the customer needs to take into account. So when you think about those four boxes, you know, inevitable discretionary, familiar, unfamiliar, you wouldn't apply the same set of sales actions, attitudes, what have you, across all four of those boxes. You, you, you'd want and you'd hope your salesperson to be able to intelligently diagnose what type of buying uh, process this was and adapt accordingly. And, and I think that's, well, that's almost an internal outcome yeah, uh, approach. Yeah, so what are the steps that as a salesperson I need to be and thinking about what are my uh, indicators of success and progress and what have you. So the classic two by two matrix tends to break that down and make it fairly easy to understand. But I want to, as we get more into some of the complexities and, and in kind of the wiring, if you will, of how this whole thing works, I want to talk for a minute about your blog. I mean, your blog is great. I'd recommend everyone who's listening, go and subscribe to Bob's blog. We'll have a link below in the show notes. You contribute to a lot of sales journals. One thing that I find very consistent about your content is that it tends to be pretty cerebral. And it acknowledges the fact that this is all complex. It's not simple. Everyone's told we need three bullet points. And, and, and if you get more complex than that, then people's brains fry. Well, that doesn't do justice to the complexity of what we're talking about doing. And so I'm wondering how you arrived at the point where you were willing to just um, uh, push back against this conventionalism that there needs to be an easy button and reconcile yourself to the fact that you had to just embrace the complexity of. Well, um, I think partly it's because I have uh, chosen to focus on what people call complex sales. Mm -hmm. and, and complex sales actually normally also reflect a complex buying process. And you can't apply a painting by numbers approach <laughs> to complex environments. You can't make unjustified assumptions that are gonna trip you up later. Right. And, and candidly, um, I hope it doesn't sound arrogant, but I'm writing for intelligent and thoughtful salespeople and intelligent and thoughtful sales managers, mm -hmm. people who know that this idea of silver bullets or miracle cures it, it is a nonsense. Right. Uh, and there are enough blogs out there, um, you know, do three things and you're guaranteed to be successful. I don't think that reflects reality. But I do hope, on the other hand, that in recognizing that we live in a complex world, we're competing in a complex world, our interactions with our customers, um, particularly if there are multiple players involved, um, are complex, that we shouldn't overcomplicate things for the sake of complexity. So there is a balance to be struck, and I'm always conscious of it, the, the, the sort of challenge of recognizing complexity and yet pro trying to provide guidelines which are no more complicated than necessary to help people navigate it. It's one reason why I've, I've tried to distill many of the aspects of outcome-centric selling into a form where you could summarize the most important elements in a single page. Now, 
you know, there's nuance and detail and so on behind it. But I, I think the essence of trying to master complexity is to make it no more complicated than is necessary and to stimulate people to think about what they know and what they don't know right. and, and to encourage them to resolve to fill in the gaps in their understanding and not rely on uh, hope or assumption. <laughs> hope, yeah, for sure. Um, so along the way, as you were creating outcome-centric, I think one of the building blocks or a subroutine, if you will, kind of taking something from the software world, is your IMPACT, I-M-P-A-C-C-T, deal qualification framework. And I think that kind of evolved from MedPIC or MedPIC plus P or some of these different things that float around. Tell me about the origin of that and, and how you use it. Uh, you know, and I'll acknowledge, uh, actually, this is true for many of the things that I have tried to bring together into outcome-centric selling, that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, the people who came up with Medic or MedPIC. And, you know, you're right, there are probably two or three wide variations of uh, Medic, you know, do you add an extra C, a P, uh, and so on. Uh, and I think of the impact framework not as a, I don't know, um, a competitor to Medic, but rather building on it and just trying to reorder some of the thinking into what I saw as a more logical flow of qualification. Uh, one of the challenges with with Medic that I saw. So, if you can, was, before, before we jump all the way in, tell us what the acronym IMPACT stands for. Yes, sure. Uh, and you correct me if I get any of this wrong. <laughs> through. So, uh, metrics, um, you're either uh, economic buyer, uh, decision process, um, decision criteria, I think I've got that right, uh, issues and uh, champion at minimum. And then you could add um, competition as another C, or you could add paper process as part of the process. And then impact, take us through that one. Well, it, 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 in some ways you can think of it as just a bit of a reordering okay. because it, you don't typically start a customer conversation or a qualification with metrics. Those metrics end up being important. But from my perspective, the most important thing you need to start with is, is there an issue and its associated implications? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't matter about the metrics if there's no issue. It's the issue that drives change. So impact simply attempts to reorder and maybe slightly redefine that medic formula, but to start with the thing that is the most important thing uh, as a foundation of any uh, complex change program, and that's there are issues and impacts that need to be dealt with. And I'm going to embarrass myself that I did not actually research, and I can't tell you what each of those letters stands for, but I've, I've got a suspicion you mentioned commitment questions earlier. Is one of those Cs related to commitment questions? Uh, no, it isn't, because I think commitment questions are um, a way of testing qualification. They're certainly part of accelerating the process and so on. But the Cs are more to do with, um, you know, whether you have a champion, whether you have um, a competition, but competition, remember, you redefined competition, I think. We did together. That competition's really about their alternative options and not just about... Including doing that. Um, yeah. Um, so, so impact helps to qualify, but let's talk philosophically about qualification. Not only do we have to have that self-honesty, do we have to have accountability, do we have to have great sales managers to coach and tease information out, help people understand how to ask the hard questions to make sure they're not just hoping and assuming, all that kind of stuff. But philosophically, we can either elect to qualify deals in, you know, we get a trade show lead, let's make sure this is the right kind of buyer and they've got budget. Okay, this is qualified, great. It's in the pipeline. Now let's run the process. Or you can, on a very regular and consistent basis, attempt to qualify deals out. They're in the pipeline. They're sitting there. 
we're not going to assume that just because they got in, they they belong there and stay there. We're going to constantly be evaluating whether or not we need to kick it out. Talk about that philosophical well, difference. Well, again, I think there's a difference between very simple transactional sales, where I think it probably is possible to do a one and done uh, qualification, short sale cycle, relatively uncomplicated. But in the sort of world in which my clients mostly live, and that is pretty lengthy, complicated, multiple stakeholder um, environments. Um, qualification is not a one-off event. In fact, I'm rather dubious of labeling sales stage qualifying because uh, I actually think you need to be qualifying and re-qualifying throughout the sale. Uh, 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 and also, you can't expect to completely qualify in one conversation in a complex environment. So you start with the things you can master, and then you progressively fill out and uh, and, and test this. So yes, absolutely, uh, qualification is something that really shouldn't stop until you reach the point at which you've got the customer's commitment to to move forward. You know, part of qualifying is, uh, have I got access to and am I, am I making progress through the whole, you know, the final approval element of um, the the decision making? And, and, and sometimes you don't really know that until the opportunity has got to be pretty mature. And you raised a great uh, example 10 minutes ago where you mentioned, yeah, there may be budget approved for it now. In other words, it's qualified based on the fact there's allocated budget and, and it's set aside and everyone's agreed. But suddenly those budget priorities change. And that's a perfect example of why a deal that was eminently qualified would suddenly become unqualified. Yeah, I mean, by the way, I, I, I love, um, I'm not a great fan of thinking of selling as purely linear. You mentioned Sampler, by the way, and I think there's a lot of stuff I really like about Sampler. I like the something which I, I've chosen to call um, uh, pre-agreed next steps. I think um, some of them might call it upfront mm -hmm. commit. There's one thing I'm a bit uncomfortable with the traditional sampler, and that's the visualization of the sales process as right. a summary, where you can only ever move forward through the stages. You slam the watertight door behind right. you. Now, I think if you look at what Gartner have said um, about the true nature of a complex buying process, it's not... Uh, you know, a single linear set of stages with watertight doors between them. It actually looks like a bowl of spaghetti. Yeah, that, that, you know? that graphic you shared a number of times, I think it's called long, hard slog, if I remember correctly, that shows yeah. how convoluted that buying journey is when you've got a sales team with more than 10 people, according to typical research in complex sales. There's Each of them has their own personality, their own personal priorities and biases, departmental agendas and everything else. It's it's it it really is almost overwhelming when you think of it as a salesperson. How do you possibly wrangle this whole thing? Well, again, striving for perfection is impossible, I think. But you can help to eliminate um, the unknowns, and you need to also go into it expecting things will change and not be over comfortable. Uh, so you know. Internal circumstances might change. External circumstances might change. A whole variety of things can conspire. So it is back to qualification. And what are the implications of you know the customer having a being quite capable of going back to basics or retreating one or two steps because of something that's just happened? Um, and of course, your qualification needs to reflect the current circumstances and not a historical snapshot. So if you talk about culture, firstly, I think we, we need to be encouraging salespeople to ask themselves, this is part of the self-honesty thing, is this still true? Well, actually, even before that, am I confident that what I think I know, I actually know? Have I got the evidence to prove it as the customer demonstrated it in a commit. But I think we also need to be very open-eyed about the idea that things change. So the salesperson themselves, I think, needs to be alert to it. And I think the smarter salespeople are. Um, but I think the role of sales manager is very important as well. And I did write a blog several years ago, I think, uh, 
characterizing one of the roles of the sales manager as to act as devil's advocate and to, when you do an opportunity review, don't just reiterate current stage, next step, value, probability, and so or on. How can I help you? Tell me what you need me to do next for you. Well, yeah, I mean, that's sort of a bad question to ask, but is the, those that group of questions, again, are still pretty limiting in terms of adding value. Um, it is to act as devil's advocate, to push um, the salesperson to really think and to justify why they're running with the opportunity and to provide the evidence. Now, there is a really, really important thing I, I believe about qualification that's again sometimes missed. It, it should never be a tick box exercise. Whether you use BANT or you use MEDIC or IMPACT or what have you, um, for every factor that you choose to qualify against, the salesperson should be capable of justifying the evidence. Why is it that you believe that to be true? So qualitatively. Yeah, yeah and that might be, I got a documented email, I've got this or that, but um, you know, it's really tan tangible evidence, right. not just hope. Right. And, and so I think absolutely the role of the intelligent, informed sales manager is to test whether evidence exists to support the salesperson's assessment of the situation. And in doing that, they will make the salesperson a better salesperson because they'll, they'll develop the muscle memory and the habit that says, um, I can't rely on assumption or hope. And, um, and great salespeople, hmm? in my experience, great salespeople will, you know, nobody likes being criticized, but great salespeople will embrace it whereas mediocre salespeople will resent it. Yeah. Now, um, I, I, I think the reaction to coaching, that's a very interesting point, is one of the attributes of, have I got a great salesperson here in front of me, or have I got a rather mediocre one? The, the great ones, I think, never stop learning. Right. The mediocre ones kind of may come to believe they, they've done it all, they know it all, they you know, just let me get on with it. So, and I think that's so dangerous in a world that is changing. Yeah, and it's it's to me, it's mind blowing. But there are salespeople that I mean, uh, here's here's kind of an interesting attribute that I've seen of extraordinary salespeople. If their company isn't paying for them to get sales training, they're going to go find it and buy it themselves. I mean, great salespeople do that. Mediocre salespeople don't. Those that are second yeah. and third standard deviation talent will invest in themselves. Those who are average talent will wait for the company to invest in them. Uh, by the way, I, I, I've worked with a number of clients on what should we try and ask potential candidates about. And to your point, one of the things I guide them to look for is that the candidate takes initiative themselves in personal development, whether it's buying training, whether it's subscribing to thought leadership articles, whether it's, you know, having a full and completely read bookshelf of <laughs> some of the latest, you know, it's that pers personal commitment to improve. Right. Um, I want to come back in a minute to this, to this uh, contrast between the idea of a very linear sales process and this completely chaotic buying journey. But before I forget, I want to pull on that thread where you talked about requalification, the sales manager's role, the idea that there needs to be a qualitative justification. And I think you actually advocate for having a very customized CRM that you tie in with outcome centric sales. It almost has a continuum for each of those where it could be red or green, kind of the yes or no, but also uh, an amber or a yellow, recognizing the yeah. fact that kind of, but we're not quite sure. Um, how does CRM fit into driving some of this change and maintaining accountability and self-honesty? Well, some of the more advanced implementations actually embed that that thinking, that logic, that color-coded visualization. Um, but, but generally, when I've worked with clients who haven't yet done that, I've actually suggested that they take an intermediate step. 
And that's to uh, do it in the form of a very simple one-page spreadsheet, which is updated and attached to the opportunity. And the reason I suggest that is because you learn things through applying that that will then cause you to think differently, probably, right. about specifically how to embed it in the CRM. So I think it's entirely possible to take an evolutionary approach to this. But the ultimate goal, yes, having decided what's really important. And, and sometimes CRM systems get over-engineered because people just chuck a lot of wish list items into it, and it just makes it too complicated to be helpful. It becomes a burden. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think the right balance has been struck when there's enough information in the CRM to be valuable to both the salesperson and the manager, and they can rely on the information, and it acts as a really valuable reminder to the salesperson of what they have and haven't done and what they do and don't know and so on. Um, but not pursued to the extreme where it's collecting information, which frankly is never subsequently analyzed um, or applied. So, you know, there's a absolute, there's a balance point there. But yes, I think once you've worked out what really is important, maybe verified it by doing it in a very sort of simple uh, spreadsheet per opportunity approach, then there's tremendous value then in embedding it into the CRM. In fact, I've, I've done that with um, uh, George Bronton's membrane uh, application, which particularly lends itself as a CRM to complex sales. And you can get that visualization, you can get the reminders of what you know and what you don't know, and you can decouple some of the knowledge from stages. You can so, for example, say, in an ideal world, you need to have known and done this. But the most important thing is you characterize the current stage of the opportunity accurately. And then flag that there's still some stuff that you know, is, is missing, rather than either force it forwards or, or, or force it backwards. Right. And finally, if you're phases or stages, uh, the more closely those phases or stages reflect where the buyer is in their journey rather than following a prescribed, extremely linear, tick box based sales process, um, the more accurate your forecasts are going to be and so on. And so that creates a challenge, obviously. I mean, you talked about Sandler slamming those submarine doors closed as you go along mm -hmm. compared to that long, hard slog. Gartman graphic yep. that shows how convoluted and chaotic the buying journey is. And, and that leads some people to kind of throw up their hands. I saw a LinkedIn post recently from somebody who's a, 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 an important and worthwhile thinker in the digital marketing space, admittedly with a product-led growth model. In other words, a freemium that their goal is to attract people and let people sell themselves. And then once they're hooked, then bring the rest of the organization in. So it's a different sort of a sales model. But this person was saying basically, the new sales is just being available when somebody's ready to buy and essentially relying on marketing to do all the work. Now, if the buyer is 70% of the way through the buying journey before they want to talk to a rep, um, then marketing does have to do some of that, but there has to be integration between the two. I reject the idea that the role of sales is just be available when somebody wants to buy, but clearly we need something different than, you know, kind of an 80s sort of a uh, rather outdated um, sales model. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I think it's a, almost an abrogation of responsibility to just say the role of salesperson is to be around when, when needed. Right. Because it, it doesn't, that mindset uh, sort of restricts us from influence when we know that in complex buying journeys, the salesperson or the organization that's been most influential in helping the customer shape their thinking emerges with a huge advantage. So it's kind of institutionalizing um, that lack of accountability that we talked about some a while ago. So I, 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 if you're in a pure PLG model, you know, try it, you'll like it, order more, you might be able to make that work. But the, candidly, most of my clients are not in that world. They're in a somewhat complex 
uh, investment and, and buying decision, um, they typically tend to be offerings that have an impact in perhaps multiple areas of the company that's going to buy them. So it's not as straightforward as download it, test it, right. use it, and, and so on. Uh, so I, I, I'm not trying to deny that in a pure PLG play, there might be this rather straightforward, you know, f- almost facilitation right. approach. But I don't think the role of salesperson is only to facilitate buying. I think it is to influence it. Um, and and also candidly to um, acknowledge to the customer if there is a bad fit, to say so sure. uh, and not to, you know, cling on it for fear that disqualifying will make your pipeline look smaller. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I, I heard you say at one point something about how there's almost an inverse relationship between the how swollen the pipeline is and the sales capability and great salespeople tend to have much leaner pipelines. Of course, they've got a much higher close rate and they're qualifying very consistently. Whereas mediocre salespeople throw all the stuff into the pipeline to try to look like they're somehow being effective. Well, and uh, but, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, they're sort of supported and encouraged in that by managers. Right. If the managers beat them up, right. uh, uh, their pipeline not having sufficient um Coverage. Yeah, there's much greater tolerance to let sales. deals just roll month to month and quarter to quarter than to not be injecting as much into the pipeline as somebody wants to see. So, and that's where being devil's advocate on the sales managers uh, so important. And you know, if you're not going to succeed, you're far better off discovering that early and moving on than you know clinging on, hoping a miracle will will happen. Right. I think this is another aspect of sales culture. Um, you know, some organization cultures uh, promote the right behavior, and some, unfortunately, without realizing it, promote dysfunctional uh, behavior. Right. Yeah, I, I worked with a company one time where, as I got to know them, I discovered that one of the fields on the home on their opportunity homepage in their CRM that a rep was supposed to fill in when they first created the opportunity was what percent discount they anticipated they were going to have to offer to get the deal done. <laughs> I mean, you're institutionalizing mediocrity at that point. And wh- where's it going to go from there? So so we're talking about a degree of complexity. We need sales reps that can really play 3D chess. They need to be psychologists. They have to have business acumen, and understand business finance. What would you say are the requisite attributes of a strong, strong sales rep for complex sales these days? Uh, well, there, there are a few. Um, uh, perhaps some of the most important are things that, yeah, genuinely curious, um, yeah, thoughtful without overthinking. And by that, I mean, you know, sometimes you see people behaving as if I've got to do more research before I can right. reach out. And, uh, you know, do enough research, but get engaged in uh, conversation. Um, I think they need to have sufficient product knowledge, but also to have the discipline not to share how much product knowledge they have <laughs> in inappropriate circumstances. Right. So, uh, you know, again, I'm not arguing you don't need to know your product. I, I think I am arguing that sometimes you need the simplest description of what you can offer aligned to what um, the customer is really looking for rather than just giving them a dump. Here's another thing. Um, I actually wrote an article for, I think it's going to come in Top Sales World in a month or two, but my experience helping my wife buy a car. Mm. I mean, some of the car salespeople just were so wound up by the features and functions of the car, they spent all their time talking about it and not asking my wife what she wanted to use the car for and what was important. So good discovery, self-honesty, intelligence, a uh, commitment to personal uh, development. Um, you know, some of the things that um, you probably want to assess for include um, the uh, the discipline to say what needs to be said and not what you think the customer wants to hear. Right. Now, there's a whole bunch of other attributes, but, you know, off the top of my head, 
those are some of the ones I'd, um, I, I'd look for. Uh, uh, there are many more. And, and then for background, some of the statistics out there about the state of sales are alarming. Our, our mutual friend, Andy Miller, recently shared some data that he found with Sales Benchmark Index that showed that 56% 50 of CEOs don't have confidence in their CRO's ability to hit targets. There's data that shows that more than 60% of reps consistently miss quota. Um, you know, it really feels like an overwhelming kind of epidemic of mediocrity. And, and there's no doubt that fixing it will take a lot of work and time and diligence and accountability. Um, but I gather from listening to you and following you that, that you're optimistic that it can be fixed. I am, um, you know, harking back to, was it Tom Peters' book? You've got to make sure you've got the right people on the bus. Mm -hmm in the right seats on the bus and the bus has got to be moving in the right direction. So, you know, I am optimistic with the right people involved in the right uh, positions, you know, with the right framework that we can master the complexities of today's and, and, and future uh, business environments. But I think being over prescriptive in a world which is changing so quickly, isn't necessarily the right the right formula for that, right. you know. Um, you talked about product, yeah, PLG type selling. Uh, it, it, I it, oh, ten years ago, I think I listened to Neil Rackham uh, presenting at Portsmouth University, and he predicted that you know um, selling was going to almost shift its shape from a, a shape where. You know, most selling was somewhere in the middle, you know, neither over complicated nor over simplified. And of course, what we see now is technology is transactionalizing simple sales. It, you know, it will cut salespeople out from that process. I think I saw it already it, has. According to a McKinsey survey, I think companies are increasingly comfortable with e commerce purchases up to $150,000. Uh, again, I think it, 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 this, I'm sure there's some nuance behind that uh, between is that purchase for something that's been bought before successfully or is it purchasing something which is a brand new initiative? I mean, I suspect there's some nuance underneath mm -hmm. that, but absolutely. Uh, and then the other end of the scale, an increased importance of uh, the, the feeling that uh, the customer is being well advised by a well informed organization represented by a salesperson, not just by a chatbot or FAQs. <laughs> and, and, and I think I'm not sure whether I actually responded when you were asking about, you know, the profile of the effective modern B2B salesperson. I think it's one, it, it's somebody that absolutely understands the business issues that their customers are likely to be facing and has been well equipped through training, through work that marketing does and so on to have informed discussions and uh, discussions with their customers that leaves the customer thinking i'm glad i spoke to that salesperson that was a good use of my time i learned something important and the sad fact is it's probably still true that the majority of customers when they have agreed to have a conversation with a salesperson don't walk, walk away thinking that was a good use of my time I'm smarter as a result of the conversation. You know, I look forward to the next conversation. It's the opposite almost. And I think that's a big reason why, you know, salespeople are struggling. They're struggling to even engage to start with. And, and or, I think you're right that there's that dissatisfaction among buyers, the results or the value of that conversation with the sales rep. But that's, that's for the primary buyer that they're accustomed to talking to. And then there's nine others or 11 others on the yeah. buying team with completely different perspectives. You can imagine how dissatisfied they are with those conversations. It's a miracle we sell anything, and yet we do. <laughs> All right. And we do because um, uh, for the most part, I hope we're addressing real needs and our addressing of those needs is helpful to the organizations we, we sell to. And, you know, I wouldn't want to be part of a sales organization that couldn't point to that, say that. So so we're going to finish optimistically that all of us can get better. Sales teams can get better. We can get more effective. We'll have less deals, loss of no decision. We'll have to deliver better outcomes for buyers. 
all that kind of stuff. Now, for people that want to learn more, obviously, the first step is to go sign up for your blog, follow you on LinkedIn, track your content. But where do you go? Where do you go to learn about stuff? What blogs, what YouTube channels, what podcasts do you recommend? Uh, a, a lot. I mean, I read a lot. We talked about the Jolt Effect. I try and keep up to date. You know, they probably read multiple new sales books every year. Some are rehashing of old ideas. Some are updating, you know, with new thinking. Uh, at Gartner, um, Hank Barnes, uh, I find uh, very interesting as a blogger. Dave Brock, I think, who we who we know. Um, and there's a sort of a, a bunch of others. I, I, I follow some of the sales methodology um, companies. Um, I network within the... Um, Institute of Sales Professionals, I found that a good source of information. Um, I think you mentioned that I um, contribute to the International Journal of Sales Transformation, and I find that environment a stimulating one. And it's really it, 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 a mixture of both academic, academics, not quite the right word, but, you know, um, let's use it for the moment, uh, and practical. Right. Um, and I keep stumbling across uh, new ones, but people like Brock and Hank Barnes and so on. Um, and I, I, I'm sure you've got your own favorites as, uh, as well. Yeah, I think there's a lot of resources out there. What people have to do is find what works for them, what stimulates the thinking, what they're willing to engage with consistently, rather than just happen to see a link that somebody else has shared. I mean, there's value in that. Sometimes you find new things, but, but it's, it's a disciplined effort on a continuing basis. What's as as we wrap up here? What's your biggest concern about the profession of sales? Uh, that the less effective, less thoughtful members of the profession queer the pitch for the salespeople who are genuinely see this as a an honourable um, profession, uh, which I certainly do. So. Um, uh, 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 you know, we, we have a community where there, there are people at all ends of the scale and spectrum, aren't there? So I think my my, my concern is naive marketeers, also, uh, you know, salespeople who can't resist the itch to pitch, uh, make it harder for the, the, the more thoughtful and professional ones to thrive. But they will because they'll be smart enough to find ways around it and to create trust. But, but that, that's a worry for me. I'm not worried about um, professional sales being automated out of existing, so chat botted or uh, you know, chat GPT botted. There's a role for technology, but I think there remains a very important role for intelligent, thoughtful um, salespeople to bridge between all the stakeholders in the organizations that they're trying to sell to and, you know, actually both their own, their own organizations, their employers' internal strengths, and a whole stream of other information that's ultimately valuable right. um, to the customer. So excellent salespeople will, the, the cream rises to the top, they'll continue to be excellent, they'll continue to evolve. As, as long as they continue to evolve right. and they have that always be learning. And I think that's probably an attribute anyway. It'd be hard to reach the position sure. of a highly yeah. effective salesperson without already having that in your day and age. Yeah, good point. All right. People want to find you, reach out to you, have a conversation with you. I'll drop the link for your blog below in the show notes, but how do people connect with you and find you? So I, uh, uh, as you said, I, I, I run uh, inflection-point.com as a website. There's a blog associated with that. Um, I, I'd certainly encourage those of you who aren't already subscribers to the International Journal of Sales Transformation to sign up for that, for Top Sales World, for other sales publications. You can find me on Twitter and on LinkedIn, and uh, I'll do my best to share ideas that I hope you'll find, you know, stimulating and informative. And if at any time what I say has some resonance and you can see that you'd like to be able to implement some of these approaches internally, uh, there's a link uh, right at the top of my webpage to uh, a Zoom call booking system, and I'd be delighted 
uh, to just get a conversation started. Terrific. Well, a great resource. I recommend people take advantage of it. And this has been really a, a this conversation has exceeded my already high expectations. And I, I thank you very much for your time, Bob. Give us a final keystone observation to pull the entire conversation together. Well, I think we've, we've said it, but if you don't mind being a little repetitive, um, you know, our customers really don't care about our company. They don't care about how many logos we put up on the <laughs> first page in our sales presentation. They don't care about how many Harvey balls we uh, manage to engineer in our competitive comparison feature for feature against other solutions. What they care about is the business outcomes that are achieved. And that happens at both the organizational level and at the personal level. And the way we help our customers to achieve those outcomes is giving them both rational and emotional confidence in the decisions we're hoping they're going to make. And there you have it. There's the mic drop. That's outcome-centric selling. Um, Bob Apollo, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your insights. I really enjoyed this conversation. Ed, thank you very much for the invite. I've, uh, I've equally uh, enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. My pleasure.